1963 rolls around, but we should have ominous sort of high-pitched <sighs> violin music. And we have what is known as the beaching plan. And beaching is a name which echoes with horror and consternation in the halls of British Railway aficionados. Okay, go on. So at the time when most of the world was modernizing, was laying down thousands of miles of track, we employed someone to tear up half our railways. Why? Well, why indeed? <laughs> <sighs> this all really comes back not to Beeching, whose name is held responsible for this disaster, but for a guy called Ernest Marples, the Minister for Transport. Right. I've said before that the Ministry for Transport was basically the sock puppet of the road lobby. Well, Ernest Marples exemplifies this to a T. He founded a motorway construction company called Marples Ridgeway after the oh. war with a mate from the army and a five-ton truck, right. uh, which then grew to large sizes. He owned 80% of the shares while he was in office. While he was in office, which was, of course, illegal. So when challenged to owning shares here, he sold the shares. He tried to sell it to his business partner, but the attorney general blocked it because he'd signed a condition in that transfer that he'd get them back as he'd given them afterwards, which is not really relinquishing ownership of it, is it? Uh, So then he got around it by selling the shares to his wife. Oh, come on. Yes, no, this is literally what happened. The attorney general didn't block that. Apparently that's fine. Oh, God. Maybe they didn't know about it. I don't know. Uh, So I'll also point out that investigations into the Profumo affair, which was a scandal that rocked this government, uh, basically a sex scandal to do with, was it Christian Keeley and a Soviet spy and so on? Uh, This revealed that Marples was in the habit of hiring prostitutes and dressing up in women's clothing while being (laughs) whipped. The story was suppressed at the time because it would damage the government. It came out years later after all the damage was done. Uh, It gets worse, though, because in 1975, he packed all of his wealth into two suitcases and fled to Monte Carlo to avoid paying 30 years of overdue tax, as well as dodging two lawsuits demanding over £200,000 and a third threat of legal action over a block of flats which he rented out that was falling apart due to lack of maintenance. And in the ultimate irony, he fled on a train. (laughs) (laughs) He actually had to flee on a train because he'd been convicted of drink driving and was serving a one-year motoring ban, not an auspicious <laughs> sign for an ex-minister of transport. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess you've got to use the trains then, haven't you? So this caricature of a man is the guy who is in charge of transport in the country, and he is the man who basically murdered Britain's railway system in favour of motorways, which he had a massive vested financial interest in. This is British politics for you, I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, yes, I should have said content warning, huge amounts of national self-harm from yeah. here on out. So it's, like, honestly, it just seems to be strengthening Corbyn's argument. So it's not just Corbyn's argument no, for nationalisation. The most recently made by Corbyn. You know, I do feel that nationalising the railways is actually a very conservative argument at this point. I... I can definitely agree. You can to make it. the case from yeah. the immense cultural heritage mm. that we have in railways. Our mm. history of our entire nation is tied up with the railways, mm. and perhaps that should be respected. But we'll get onto that in the privatization yeah, yeah. discussion. Yeah. So let's look at what the beaching plan entailed. So the red lines on here are to be kept, all of the black lines are to be scrapped, and all of the dashed lines are ultimately to be scrapped. Sorry, the red lines to be kept and the black ones would be scrapped. Yeah, it's a bit counterintuitive. Right. No, 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 that's fine. You, you can, oh, look at that. You can see, actually, like, I mean, for example, across Wales. Yeah, you know. Wales was devastated. Yeah, and, and in the north as well, there's a bunch yeah, of north lines. north was devastated, Scotland yeah. was devastated, yeah. East Anglia was devastated. Yeah. And I'm, this hit my hometown particularly yeah. hard. I've pulled some extracts from the local papers yeah. of people writing in to complain. Sorry, about can we scroll down a bit more on that, John, just so I can see, yeah, just south, a bit, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, the Cornwall it, as yeah, well yeah, yeah, is just stripped out. Yeah, yeah, because it's insufferable. The train's going to Cornwall now. Yeah, it, it's yeah. absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, total southeast focus. That's all fine. Yeah, you know, very little of that got mm-hmm. scrapped. No, but, but look at the Midlands as well. I know. That's disgusting. I know. <laughs> How was this allowed? <laughs> I just. I, I'm actually really quite annoyed. Literally, everyone hated it. Yeah, well, except I can for see the why. people in charge, which were the Treasury, 
The people in London. The yeah. Department of Transport and a few people in government. Yeah. Uh, all including living. Including Ernest Marbles. All living in. A Clearly squ- lost his marbles. Like a couple of square miles in the centre of London. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Which is unaffected. Mm hmm. That's it's mad, isn't it? Yeah, that's insane. Many of these scrapped railways are now scenic walking routes, or some of them are cycling routes. Yeah. But they absolutely devastated local economies. Let's just look at what the beaching cuts entailed. Yeah. So he destroyed about 5,000 route miles of track. We had 23,000 to start with. I believe that had been consolidated into about 22, 21,000 by this time. Mm. Um, almost every non profitable line was destroyed. This resulted in all the feeder lines being closed, and far from reducing railway expenditure, increased it by 50%. So even on purely financial terms, which were the ways they looked at it, ignoring the value of railway structure as a social good, and in every other respect, it failed. Hmm. In every respect, this was an act of pure, unmitigated national self-harm. The only people it benefited were those who had a financial interest in road. Because, I mean, I'm just looking at, like, Cornwall, for example, Mm -hmm. right? The so the, the reason I point this out is because I have to use this train mm-hmm. to get to Newquay, mm-hmm. which actually does have a railway station as you, and you can see it yep. going from for people who don't know past Plymouth. It's the St Austell, the the fork that goes up to the north coast in Cornwall. Mm-hmm. That's the Newquay one. But the, look at all of these other ones that have just been erased, gutted. Yeah, and left that, with no alternative transport except yeah. the roads. And people, oh, New, Newquay's become like you know this sort of you know party town for the mm-hmm. summer holidays. Well, all of these other places could have been the same. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, but it gets worse. If you applied this same logic to roads, you would rip up every road and driveway that's not a major motorway. Mm. This is obviously mm. nonsense. Mm. The motorways need the feeder lanes. They need the driveways yeah. in order to <laughs> work at all. And the same logic applies to railways. The main trunk lines are only popular because people coming from the outskirts mm. have to use them. And they use these smaller lines to get there, even if those smaller lines are unprofitable on a ticket basis. It's also worth pointing out that Railways have never been a massive earner. They usually roughly break it even over the long term. Mm. Companies that have managed to really make it work are ones that make their profit out of the infrastructure monopolies they can build at either end. Hotels, restaurants, and yeah. so on. But railways themselves are profitable not because of their direct impact, but like all good infrastructure, because they massively stimulate the rest of the economy. Well, I was going to say, I mean, roads aren't profitable, are they? I no, don't make money from roads. No, roads are massively expensive. But well, yeah, but exactly. But like, in, that, it, like you exactly as you said, infrastructure is a stimulus to other areas of the economy. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, well, the rails aren't making money. Yeah, okay, but everything else surrounding them is making money. Mm-hmm. So it's a worthwhile cost to accrue, mm-hmm. accrue, right? They even destroyed the Oxford to Cambridge line, which Beeching hadn't even called for the destruction of. They just tore it up anyway. <laughs> We're just tearing stuff up. But just don't mind us. They're now talking about rebuilding it. It's a cost of billions of pounds. Not the same one, but a new one. And you would think if you wanted any two mm. historic cities to be connected, it would be Oxford and Cambridge. You'd yeah. want a triangle Oxford, Cambridge, London, at, at the very least. I mean, honestly, the, the North and Wales I'm looking at and thinking, what a tragedy that must have been for those mm. people. Oh, absolutely. Like the, you know, the, the actual convenience of the thing. I mean, this whole saga is the strongest argument for left-wing appeals to trade unions and mm. uh, m- rural mobilization, political mobilization, and so on, that you've ever seen. Because these small communities had no political power, and they had their lives destroyed by a handful of mafiosos, frankly, in government. I mean, imagine if you're a hotel or a pub on any of these train lines that you rely on people passing through and coming to this area Mm -hmm. via the train, which, again, major part of your economy, Mm -hmm. and the government like, yeah, so we're removing the train line now. Yeah, literally at a time when every other country is doing the opposite. Yeah. Laying down more track, we'd rip ours up. And the publication was called Reshaping British Railways, or the reshaping of British yeah. Rail, and uh, the oh, let me get this right, the Rail Workers Union. I forget the name of it exactly. Uh, it's like the Union of Railmen, or uh, but they published a pamphlet in response called "The Misshaping of British Railways," yeah, yeah. and just went through it almost point by point. And I'll quote from it briefly: "The rape of the railways will benefit private road hauliers and bus companies." 
it will enrich the petrol, oil and motor car magnates, and it will profit the land speculators and road builders. They are poised for their pickings, but it will punish the aged, the infirm and poorer people who cannot afford to run a car. Mm. We recall that a 12-year-old schoolboy faulted some of the published information. An error of 20,000 tonnes weekly was found respecting a small section of line. It altered the picture completely. Who knows how many other errors went undetected? This was a really sloppy piece of engineering and actually a, a testament for why scientists and engineers can sometimes be too blinkered and they can make arguments like this saying, oh, well, it's science. We've done the calculations and you know, I'm from Imperial Chemical Institute and I have all of these experts on my board and we've decided yeah. that this is the right thing to do. So shut up, peasant. But let's look at some of the mistakes that uh, they made in hindsight. Passenger traffic estimates were based on one week of analysis carried out outside the holiday season, which stacked the results against all of the seasonal tourist routes. Madness, Especially right. a problem for the South and Cornwall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the effect of feeder lines was disregarded and almost all of the value of the railways was disregarded. So this is the cultural value, the historic value, the local value, the value as an economic stimulus as the places it's yeah. serving. All that was taken into account was the profit and loss of the lines themselves and the tickets taken on them. This was a thoroughly blinkered and myopic view of it. Yeah, not the way you would assess any other form of transport. No. <laughs> it's a complete axe job, and this is why this yeah. is often called Beeching's Axe or the Beeching Bomb. Yeah, because it did do it. more damage to Britain's infrastructure than the Luftwaffe by a long way. I mean, I just you can see in East Anglia, in the north, in Wales, in Cornwall, like it, and and in parts of the Midlands, the sort of mm -hmm. centre of the Midlands. If you wanted to make these communities feel isolated, mm -hmm. destroying their connections to each other, because that's the thing. Like you'll notice, a lot of the connections are. Central and now all you've got is the sort of main arteries which that lead city to can you go to which lead to London. Yeah. You know, everything is like right, how do you get mm -hmm. to London essentially? And this hit my hometown particularly hard, mm. uh, Sudbury in Suffolk, which you can see there, there's a little black line near Ipswich. We used to have a through line to Cambridge. You can get to Cambridge in under an hour, and then you're connected to the entirety of the rest of the rail transport network. Mm. That line was torn up. Now, in order to get to the railway network, you have to take a branch line to the line between Ipswich and London, then take to a relatively unpopular station, then take a branch either to Ipswich or London, and then take another train to connect yourself either to Cambridge or wherever you want to go mm. to across London. So this increases the journey time by between two and a half to three hours one way, which makes essentially rail connection to much of the country unviable. Mm. This killed Sudbury's prospects in a way as a growing town. Because no longer could you settle down there and, oh, it's just less than an hour to take the kids up to Cambridge to see the museum or attend yeah, yeah, a lecture yeah, yeah. or participate in the cultural activities yeah. there. Yeah, now, I, can, I can see. I can see. Now it takes over an hour by car and public transport. You have to take about four or five buses to get to Cambridge. There's no railway transport. So you're between two and three hours again. Yeah. Madness. Yeah. Ah. And I'm so, actually quite annoyed about this, to be honest. I didn't really know about it. I think people should be. It's one yeah. of the, when people ask, "Oh, we Britain used to be a great country with an empire, and yeah. it used to lead the world in this technology and that technology, and why mm. isn't it the case now?" You just look at sheer self harm like this. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at LotusEaters.com.